Hey, good evening, Valrico Church family. It's wonderful to be with you tonight for this third installment in our Vacation Bible School this year. I'm enjoying these lessons very, very much and the opportunity to study and prepare and then to present them. And I hope in some way they're beneficial to you. We're trying to talk in very practical terms about some of these wonderful, wonderful stories in the life of Jesus that have to do with Jesus and water. Tonight, a fascinating story out of Matthew chapter 14. I've opened my Bible there. I'll ask you to do the same if you will. We're going to spend all of our time tonight in the 14th division of Matthew's great gospel. And so we hope you'll open there, study along with us tonight as we, uh, as we continue in our VBS studies. Hope you've had a wonderful day. Thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you for studying the Bible with us this evening. Well, a true story. A preacher was flying home from a gospel meeting. This was on a Saturday. The meeting had been an old-fashioned <clears throat> Sunday through Friday meeting. And he was flying home on Saturday. And as sometimes happens, he wasn't fully prepared for Sunday morning. And so, once the plane was airborne and above 10,000 feet and a little ding had gone off, the preacher got out his laptop computer and he was feverishly working to finish his sermon. Now, the lady sitting in the seat next to it had told him when she sat down, that she was nervous. This was her very first flight ever. And as sometimes happens, turbulence began to rock the plane. And the turbulence got worse and worse and worse until finally the woman sitting next to him was scared to death. But the preacher just continued to work on his laptop as though nothing was happening at all. And finally, the lady sitting next to him, couldn't, she just couldn't take it anymore. And she finally said, how can you do that? How can you stay so calm when we all might die? And the preacher looked at her and said, Lady, if this plane goes down, I'm going to heaven. But if it lands, I've got to preach tomorrow morning. Well, what's the point of that little story? The point is that everybody experiences some turbulence, some storms in life. But almost always, life does in fact go on. Well, if it is true that Jesus came into the world to give life and life abundant, then why all the turbulence in the world? Why all the trouble? Why all the storms in the world? The Bible is very honest about that. Job 14, the beginning of verse 1. Man that is born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. And so the Bible talks about that, honestly, doesn't it? I mean, open your Bible. Open in your Bible. And you will see, you will see the suffering of Abel in the book of Genesis, all the way to the end, the suffering of saints in the book of Revelation. And in between, in between those two points, there are fiery furnaces and lion's dens and prisons and disease and death. And there are storms and storms and storms and then some more storms. Now, we all want the Bible to read like a fairy tale. And yes, there may be a big bad wolf and there may be a evil villain and maybe there are some poison apples along the way. But at the end of the story... Everybody just lives happily ever after. But you and I both know that that's not the reality of the world in which we live. And so the Bible contains stories about storms and tries to make points to Christians that storms are inevitable in life. We understand something about storms living in Florida. We are <clears throat> just about at hurricane season, of course. And so we, we understand something about storms. We know that storms bring difficulties, sometimes death, and that storms really show no partiality. And so storms befall those who are prepared and those who are not prepared. The storms still come. And the storm come to Christian and non-Christians alike. Storms affect the rich and the poor, the college student, the retiree, the businessman, and the homeless man. Storms still come. Storms come in a variety of different packages. And we've learned that by experience, haven't we? Sometimes it's a family storm. We wonder if we're ever going to get married. Wonder if we're going to be able to save our marriage. We wonder if we're ever going to be able to have children. Wonder if those children that we do have are going to grow up and be followers of Jesus, be Christians. We wonder about our kids' grades and about college and friends and dating and on and on and on. We wonder sometimes if we're doing our best as parents. We wonder how to deal, how to deal with a husband who's having an affair or a daughter who is addicted to drugs, or a son who's just announced that he's gay. We wonder sometimes how to deal with aging parents and how best to care for them. Sometimes 
It's a family storm. Sometimes it's an economic storm. We certainly understand something about that right now, don't we? And so we wonder sometimes if we're going to be able to keep our job. Wonder if we're going to lose our job. If we lose our job, we wonder if we're going to be able to find another job. Wonder if we're ever going to get out of debt. Wonder if we'll ever be able to get out of debt. Sometimes it's an economic storm. Sometimes it's a relationship storm. Strained relationships, controlling attitudes, jealousy, rivalry, failure to forgive, all of those, all of those are toxic and they take a toll on relationships, often relationships that really mean a lot to us. But because of our behavior, our attitudes, or our words, storms come. Sometimes it's a health storm, maybe for you or maybe for somebody that you love. Maybe that's a diagnosis that devastates or a treatment that seemingly has no end. Or maybe it's just a family history that causes you to live with that, that fear, that doubt, that cloud hanging over your shoulder that makes you wonder if yours is going to be the next generation of that family who's going to have to deal whatever that issue may be. Maybe that's heart disease. Maybe that's, as in my family, it's cancer or <clears throat> maybe something else. But often it's a health storm. Now, maybe, maybe you're watching this tonight and you've just kind of lived a Teflon-coated life where nothing bad has ever stuck to you. I mean, God bless you in that. But I will tell you that most individuals live of, in a far more real world, in a challenging world, a difficult, a difficult world. All right. Tonight, we go to Matthew chapter 14. And this is a familiar story. But I'm going to ask you tonight, if you possibly can, to look at the words through fresh eyes. Can you possibly read these words tonight? And read them as though you're seeing them for the very first time. Now, I want you to notice how the story begins <clears throat> in Matthew 14 and beginning in verse 22. Listen to how this, this narrative begins. Immediately after, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. Now, let's stop there for just a second. You know, nobody ever pays any attention to that first verse. Usually, that first verse is read and ignored, and we want to get to the really good stuff that we know is coming down the line. That business of Jesus walking on the water and Peter getting out of the boat and the business about faith and little faith and how does that relate to... We're anxious to get to the good stuff, and we ignore the way that Matthew begins the narrative. But verse 22 is extremely important because it really sets the stage for what is to come. And so I, I want you to look at that with me for just a second. The text begins by saying, <clears throat> immediately after this. Well, immediately after what? Immediately after what? Well, the previous narrative is about Jesus feeding the 5,000. And so this is a king who is providing blessing. And by virtue of providing food, he's providing life and hope. And the story that is before that story is a story of another king. It's King Herod. And it too is a story of feasting. It is a story of feeding. But in that story, somebody dies. And so in that story, John the baptizer dies. And so immediately after this, well, let's back up. Immediately after the story of King Herod, who provides a feast, but it brings death to John the baptizer. And then there is the story of King Jesus, who provides life and food to a multitude, and he gives them blessing and life. And so these two narratives are in stark contrast to each other. It's as if the Bible is saying, look, choose which king you want. Do you want the king that brings life or the king that brings death? And so immediately after this, and it says immediately after that, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat. Now, the operative word there is the word made. Jesus made them get into the boat. He compelled them to get into the boat. There is an intentionality there. There's a purpose there. Jesus knows because he is omniscient. He knows what's about to occur. He knows that the storm is on the horizon. He knows what's going to take place. And yet, he made them get into the boat and put them into harm's way. He knows what's about to happen here. That's very important to the story. And then third, he sent the multitudes away. He sent the multitudes away. Now, Jesus could do that because he was their rabbi. Rabbis determined when their teaching was concluded. 
just like a professor decides when the class is over. A rabbi who has followers and disciples, he decides when the teaching for the day is concluded. And so he sent the multitudes away. And maybe the lesson there for us, for us is that Jesus is our rabbi and he teaches us how to have life and how to have relationship with God. It's interesting that in the parallel passage to the feeding of the 5,000 and the Jesus teaching the multitudes, that in John 6, beginning in verse 14, they say when he multiplies the food, in the parallel passage, they say, truly, this is the prophet. This is the prophet. If anyone can multiply food like this, he must be the prophet that we've been anticipating coming from God. And then the text says that they intended to take him by, make him a king by force. Now, honestly, their motives were not altogether noble in that. John 6 and verse 26 says that Jesus looked at them and said, look, you seek me. You seek me because you saw the miracles and were filled. And so in their minds, they are no doubt thinking, look, I mean, if, if he can do this with the kid's lunch, Imagine what he could do with gold. Imagine what he could do with silver. But don't miss this, ladies and gentlemen. Don't miss this. When you put these points together from the parallel passage in John 6 and just the introductory words of Mark 14 and verse 22, when you put those thoughts together, they see him as a rabbi and a prophet and a king. But Jesus wants them to see him in one other way. Now he was a rabbi and he was a prophet and he was a king, but they, Jesus wants them to see him in one other way. I want to read to you from an Old Testament passage and you really don't need to turn there tonight. Let me just, let me just read something to you. This is out of the book of Job. This is out of the book of Job and I want you to listen to how he describes God. Listen to how Job describes God. He says, Truly, I know that it is so, but how can a man be righteous before God? If one wished to contend with him, he could not answer him one time out of a thousand. God is wise in heart, mighty in strength. Who has hardened himself against him and prospered? God removes the mountains, and they do not know. When he overturns them in his anger, God shakes the earth out of its place and causes the pillars to tremble. God commands the sun, and it does not rise. God seals off the stars. God alone spreads out the heaven, and God treads on the waves of the sea. That's an important note for our study tonight. Job says, by the way, that's Job 9, in the beginning of verse 8, God treads or walks on the waves of the sea. God walks on the sea. That last phrase is extremely important because it's saying that one of the ways that God identifies and described is described in the Old Testament. One of the ways that God is identified and described in the Old Testament is the one with the ability to tread on the sea. That is, he is the one. God is the one who can walk on water. And so for our purposes tonight, in the story of Matthew chapter 14, don't miss this, ladies and gentlemen. Jesus says, look, yes, I am your rabbi, and I am a prophet, and I am a king. But I want you to see me as more than that. I want you to see me as God. And that leads to the story that is so very familiar when Jesus walks on water. But the only one who can walk on water, of course is God. So said Job, Job 9, and beginning in verse 8. So this leads to the narrative in Matthew chapter 14. And from this story, we'd like to ask tonight just three simple questions. Here they are. Question number one, could I see some identification? Could I see some identification? And so as this individual is walking on the water, that's really what they're trying to figure out, isn't it? So in Matthew chapter 14, I want you to read with me, beginning in verse 23. When Jesus had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now, we don't, we're not told what he prayed about, but I would assume that he's praying about what's about to occur on the Sea of Galilee. Now, when even came, he was alone there. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. 
Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled and they said, it is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. Well, those verses are just fascinating, aren't they? It's interesting here that when they're in trouble and God is trying to reveal his glory and his power and be of help to them, they misunderstand who he is. You know, we misunderstand things all the time, don't we? We, we misinterpret things. We, we, just, we just see things sometimes not exactly as they are. Reader's Digest had a story about three months ago now of a, of a lady who went to get her annual physical. And you know, the first thing they do is they put you on a scale. They, they weigh you. And so when they're walking to the scale, the nurse that's taking her there says, hey, we've got a, we've got a brand new high-tech scale. You know, everything's digital and LED. And, and so the lady stands on the scale and she looks down and it says 105. And she is as excited as she can be. She tells the nurse, 105. I haven't weighed 105 since I was in college. And the nurse said, hey, don't get too excited about that. 105 is the time of day. I love that story. Because it just, it just exemplifies how sometimes we see things and we interpret them incorrectly. And so they see Jesus walking to them. And here is Jesus trying to reveal his glory, his power, and be of help to them. And their interpretation is, it's a ghost. It's a phantom. Maybe it's just an illusion. And I think we look at that and say, how could they draw the wrong conclusion about that? Well, I think they probably drew a conclusion that we might draw about that. I mean, it's between 4 and 6 a.m. in the morning. There is a storm that is raging. They believe the boat is about to capsize. Nobody. They've never seen anybody walk on water. And to our knowledge, Jesus has never done this before. And so they, they, in their mind, they, they just can't imagine that Jesus is there. Don't we sometimes do that? Could it be that sometimes we go through some difficulty, some challenge, some life-altering circumstance, and sometimes don't we say, God, where are you? And why are you so aloof? And why don't you take better care of me? So God, where, where are you? And God says, Old Testament and New Testament alike, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. You know, sometimes we don't recognize somebody and it, and it really doesn't matter. I mean, it just really doesn't matter. Um, through the years, I've been in countless airports throughout the United States. And I've, <clears throat> I've, seen, I've seen in airports a, a lot of sports figures and I've seen celebrities. And, I'll, and, and oftentimes I will see them and I will, recognize, I will recognize that I recognize them. I know them from somewhere. I've seen them on TV. I know that they're a celebrity of some kind. But it, I can't call their name. Now... If I was telling this at Temple Terrace, the whole church would be saying, yeah, Don, you don't know anybody. You can't remember anybody's name. And, that, and that's right. I, I, I really do struggle with that. But when I see these people in the airport, it really doesn't matter. I think the last celebrity I saw in an airport, I, I came home and I, I said, Vicki, I, I, saw, I saw in the airport the guy, he's got bleach blonde, crazy hair. He's got uh, tattoos everywhere, big sunglasses. He's on the, he's on the food channel. Yeah. Guy Fieri. Well, yeah, that, that's who it was. Exactly. I couldn't remember his name, but I, I knew that I knew him from somewhere, but you know what? That doesn't matter. If I don't know who those people are, if I don't recognize, if I can't call their name, it really doesn't matter. But when it comes to God, it matters. It matters when we're in a bad circumstance. We understand who God is and where God is. We understand, for example, we need to understand about Jesus that all things were made through him and without him, nothing was made that was made. And so they are terrified and yet, and yet Jesus is the one who created the very waves that are frightening them that night. And he controls them. We've already seen that. We saw it last night in our study. Who is this that even the winds and the waves obey his voice? He's Jesus, the Son of God. That's who he is. And so no wonder, he says, look, take courage. Don't, don't be afraid. And then, and then, instead of being angry at them, 
for thinking that it's a ghost, a phantom, an illusion. Instead of being angry, instead of being upset, instead of condemning them in an act of, in an act of amazing grace, he explains why they don't need to be afraid. He says, it is I, or literally, I am. Am. Now, there are two things about that. One, I think they recognize his voice. Jesus said in John chapter 10, my sheep hear my voice and they know me. They knew him. They knew his voice. I think they probably recognized that. And secondly, what he said to them would have been great comfort because he says, it is I. Literally, it is I am. Now, when we hear those words, just like every Jew, just like every Hebrew who would hear I am, am. Their minds would immediately go back to Exodus 3, the issue with the burning bush. When Moses says, whom shall I say has sent me? And God says, tell them that I am have sent you, for I am who I am. So every Jew would immediately recognize that that is the covenant name of God. That is a name that is only worn by God. And so Jesus says, look, don't be afraid. Well, why not? Because the same God who was with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is with you. The same God that was with Moses is with you. The same God that said to Joshua when he entered the promised land over and over and over again, I will be with you. That God is with you too. The God of Psalm 23, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Yea, though I go through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with me. He doesn't promise, ladies and gentlemen, the absence of pain. He promises the presence of the Savior. And don't forget, and don't forget how they got in this mess. They didn't get in this mess because they missed the 11 o'clock news and didn't get the weather forecast that there was a storm coming. No, they're in this mess because Jesus made them get in the boat. Jesus put them there. Why? Because he wanted them to learn a lesson. One author is well said. One author is well said about this story. Jesus wanted to take them where they did not intend to go to produce in them something that they could not achieve on their own. That, ladies and gentlemen, is grace. It's mercy. It's God's love. It's the living embodiment of Romans 8 and 28, that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. Romans 8, 28 doesn't say that all things are good. It says that in all things, God works for the good. And that's what's going on here. So Jesus made them get in the boat because he wanted them to learn a lesson. That's question number one. Could I see some identification? Jesus says, absolutely. I am. Question number two. Question number two. Could I join you? Could I join you? Now, this is the part of the passage that we are, with which we are eminently familiar. And so Peter answers him and said, Lord, if it is you, then command me to come to you on the water. Now, here's my question, ladies and gentlemen. Is that what you would have asked? If you were in the middle of the storm on the Sea of Galilee and the winds and the waves were about to capsize you and you thought that you were fixing to die, is that what you would have asked? I think this would be a good time to get out of the boat. I don't think so. I think what we would have asked would be the question that the sailors asked that we studied last night in that storm story. When Jesus is asleep in the boat, I think we would have been saying, Lord, if that is you, then don't you care that we're about to die? Command the wind and the waves to stop. If it's you, God, extricate me from this storm. That's what we do. You know what, Jesus, if, if that's really you and, 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 and Jesus, if you really, if you really love me, then I need you to fix the storm. I need a new job. I need a better job. I need you, I need, as a single adult, I'm tired of being single. I need you to bring somebody into my life for me to share my life with. And, and if that's you and you love me, Lord, then, then I need you to fix this financial problem that I'm in. And so, Jesus, why don't you make direct deposits into my, into my checking account? If that's really you, God, then why don't you straighten out my kids? 
Why don't you make them do better? If that's you, God, then why don't you fix my marriage? I mean, if that's really you, Jesus, and you, you love me, then why don't you command the storm in my life to stop? But Peter doesn't command the Lord to do anything. He doesn't command the Lord to do anything. And so, beginning in verse 29, Jesus said to him, well, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Do you, do you remember at the beginning, <clears throat> we read out of the book of Job, Job 9 in verse 8, that one of the designations of God is that he is the one who treads or walks on the waves of the sea. And so, ladies and gentlemen, Peter is allowed to do something that only God can do. Peter walked on the water to go to Jesus. The point, I think, of that is that obedience to God brings benefits that only God can provide. You see, God didn't command obedience because he's on an ego trip or on a power trip, but because he wants to bless his children. And so Ephesians 1, and beginning in verse 3, Blessed be the God and the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. And maybe the point of this story of Peter being allowed to walk on the water, Jesus says, sure, come on. And he does that, is again to teach us that obedience brings benefits that only God can provide. Question number three, can I get some help? Because this is an amazing thing that Peter has done. He gets out of the boat and he walks on the water. But then the narrative says that when Peter saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried out and he said, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him. And he said to him, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt I, this is fascinating, isn't it? Because we're not told how many steps Peter took. But evidently he took some steps because he's close enough for Jesus to reach out and touch. He's close enough for Jesus to hear him, ask for help. And he's close enough for Jesus to reach out and touch him. Now, I got to tell you, when, when I read this, it's amazing to me. It's amazing to me that for 2,000 years, we've given Peter grief for what? Maybe a 30-second situation in his life? Would any of us want that kind of unending critique? I mean, I, I think if Peter were, were listening tonight to, the, to, the, to, to this lesson, and uh, we're going to make this point about Peter taking his eyes off Jesus and beginning to sink, and I, I think Peter would probably say, oh man, not again. Please, can we get over that? You know what we don't hear in Jesus' voice? We don't hear the tone and we don't hear the inflection. So we don't know how he said that. You know, may, maybe, maybe he was scolding Peter. Maybe Jesus immediately stretched out his hand and caught him and said, Oh, you of little faith. Why did you doubt me, Peter? Maybe he said it like that. But maybe he said, Oh, Peter, there's still some Simon in you, isn't there? Still not a rock. In every way, are you? Why, why do you have little faith? Why do you still doubt me? See, we don't, we don't know. I will tell you this, ladies and gentlemen. We, we give Peter all kinds of grief for taking his eyes off Jesus and beginning to sink. But I think probably what he did was have a, a natural visceral reaction that probably any of us would have had in that circumstance. I mean... When he saw that the wind was boisterous, he, when he sees the waves that are about to crash and no doubt kill, if you have a massive wave that is about to take you under, wouldn't your natural human instinct be to look at that wave? I think so. 
And maybe, maybe that's the lesson here as we kind of begin to wrap this up. Maybe the lesson here is, maybe what Jesus is trying to teach us is that when we walk with Jesus, we may well have to go against what is natural to us. You see, I think the natural instinct, if you're, if you're in the boat or walking on the water in either circumstance and the wind is blowing and it's about to, to blow a massive wave and capsize the boat that you're in, the natural instinct is to look at that. And maybe the lesson that Jesus wants us to learn is that if we're going to track with him, then we're going to have to go against what's natural to us. I, uh, I moved to Florida from Indianapolis, Indiana, just outside of Indianapolis. The winters are brutal up there. And when you move to, in, to Indianapolis from a warm climate, which I did, I, I moved to Indianapolis from Houston, Texas. And <clears throat> when you move there the, in wintertime, one of the very first things that you have to learn to do is to drive on ice because there's a lot of it during the wintertime. And so you have to learn to drive on ice. And, and when you learn to drive on ice, you have to learn to react in a way that is unnatural. Because when you're driving on ice, ice and your car begins to skid, your natural response is to do two things. One is to slam on the brakes and two, to turn against the direction that you are sliding. And what you have to do is to learn to not slam on your brakes, but to barely tap, gently tap your brakes and to turn the steering wheel in the direction of the slide, at least temporarily, so that you can gain some traction. Now, that's opposite to what's natural to you. But I tell you, after you do that long enough, what was unnatural becomes natural. And even now, I've lived in Florida for over 25 years now. But if I go back to Indiana in the wintertime, and I'm driving and begin and my car begins to slide, I will now instinctively simply gently tap on the brakes and I will turn in the direction of the slide temporarily to gain some traction before I begin to try to correct. And so what was unnatural has become natural. You know, we've, we've talked in this, in this series that sometimes God asks us to do things that, that are not natural. Turn the other cheek. Forgiving others. As we said in the previous lesson, Matthew 5, 44, the hardest thing God ever asked us to do, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, pray for those who despitefully use you and persecute you. Why should we do that? Well, because it will save our life. Jesus came the altar of eternal salvation to those who obey him. The point of it is that when we're Christians, we have a new way of looking at life. It's not a natural way. It's a new way. If then you were raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, or Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. It's a new way of seeing life. It's a new way of living life. And the point of it is, ladies and gentlemen, don't miss this, that Jesus is greater, th greater than anything that I can gain in life, and he's greater than anything that I can lose in death. Jesus is greater than anything that I can gain in this life, and he is greater than anything that I can lose in death. The storms come in our life. They are legitimate and real, and they concern us. And we need to make preparation for those, and we need to try to navigate our way out of them. But the one thing that we know for certain is that regardless of what happens, our citizenship is in heaven from which we eagerly await the Savior, even the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's end tonight with this. Let me give you two things to take home. Two things to take with you from this lesson. Number one, everyone has a point of focus. Everyone. Peter took his eyes off of Jesus and it imperiled his life. Jesus said, oh, you have little faith. I think we always look at that and assume that he's talking about the size of faith, the quantity of faith, that he's talking about great versus small, big versus little. I'm not sure about that. I wonder if Jesus is talking about the duration of faith. I wonder if he's talking about having a faith that stays with him in good times and bad. I wonder if he's saying, oh, you have little faith. Your faith isn't isn't, isn't strong enough, isn't long enough just yet to stay with me through the storm. I wonder how many people 
during this pandemic have prayed to God who had not prayed to God in days or weeks or months or years or decades, but during this pandemic have prayed to God. And I wonder how many, when this pandemic passes, which one day it will, there will be a vaccine. We will also have some herd immunity and this pandemic will be in the past. I wonder how many, once the crisis is over and their life has been spared and we've moved on, I wonder how many will have completely forgotten him and just gone on with their life. And I wondered if, if this isn't those to whom Jesus would say, oh, you have little faith. Your faith isn't long enough to stay with me over the long haul. We've got to make sure, ladies and gentlemen, that we don't do that. And then secondly, God has a purpose for everything. I mean, again, remember how the passage begins. Jesus made his disciples get in the boat. Why? Because there was a plan here. There was a purpose here. Jesus had something in mind. You know, he is sovereign in this world. There is not a single maverick molecule that is outside the sovereignty of God and his son, Jesus Christ. I don't believe that God causes catastrophic events to come into people's lives. Every good and perfect gift is from above. And there is no shadow of turning in him in that. But I do believe that God can use difficult circumstances to touch hearts. And so as we, as we said in the previous lesson, you know, maybe God, maybe God is searching, maybe God's searching for you this evening. Maybe God's eyes are rooming this, are roaming this virtual, <clears throat> virtual audience right now. Again, looking for the person with a lump in their throat, an open wound in their heart with tears in their eyes. And I wonder again, as we said last night, if God is not saying, look, tell me, tell me, tell me, tell me honestly, tell me you're hurt. Tell me if you're angry, if you're confused, tell me if you're frustrated, tell me your heart. We can deal with that storm. We can do something about that. And you know why? Because here's the rest of the story, ladies and gentlemen. The rest of the story is, in verse 32, that when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those who were in the boat came and they worshipped him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. I want to tell you, that's mission accomplished. That, ladies and gentlemen, is mission accomplished. He wanted them to see him as more than a rabbi, more than a prophet, more than a king. He is a rabbi, he is a prophet, he is a king, but he says, I want you to see me as more than that. And it's mission accomplished. Truly, you are the son of God. In the previous storm story that we looked at, in the previous storm story that we looked at, when Jesus calms the sea, their question is, who can this be that even the winds and the sea obey him? I want to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, they know now, truly you, you are the son of God. Storms of life, the storms of life help us gain perspective about who we are and who Jesus is. Romans 8, verse 31. What shall we say to these things? We say this. If Christ is for us, who can be against us? The point is not the forces that align themselves against us and bring storms into our lives. The point is the person who is for us. Truly, he is the Son of God. Well, thank you. Thank you for listening so well tonight. Thank you for studying the Bible with us tonight. And we look forward to our final study tomorrow evening, a fascinating study out of John chapter 21. Look forward to being with you then. Thank you very much.